Do you think it's worthwhile trying to rebuild some of these uh, um, uh, uh, conglomerations in other parts of the city? In other words, can we try to recreate them rather than have that, you know, rather a sterile formalism that I think a lot of us don't, we don't want to see sort of like just a row upon row of uh, identical high-rise towers. So maybe if you, Paul can ask, into that and then I'll ask Elizabeth a question. I'm only going to give you one question and we may come back to you. Thank you. Paul, you can answer that. Um, you know, uh, thank you. I, th I think the first thing is the, I th think what you've got to do is firstly you've got to, these public interest um, arguments that are used to, to evict people who've lived, you know, maybe they're 40, 50, 60, 80 years, I think firstly you've got to drill down into the, into the, the reality of whether that's actually, it is a public interest issue um, to start with. But at the end of the day, flooding is, is the normally catchment issues. So I think just to focus on one little area that's causing all the problem, you, you really need to sort of have a, a, a bigger debate whether that's actually true or that there's actually a, a, a bigger a reason behind. I, I think ideally you, the starting point for a lot of this should be in situ, I think to actually relocate these uh, settlements to other areas again you you're going to fragment you're going to fragment the territorial association with their livelihoods and so forth and so i think that those those sorts of things um, would be questionable when you resettle i think the starting point for assessment of a lot of these things is is in situ before you sort of work up the other way towards the tall tower I mean, people criticise me because I, I, I say we should start in situ. Some say we should go to tall towers straight away. In fact, they argue that within four or five years they'll be acclimatised and formalised anyway, so what does it matter? But I'd argue back to them, but they can't play the formal game anyway because to play the formal game, you have to be able to pay a certain amount of rent per month and all the rest of it. If you can't play by their games, then you're evicted and moved to another settlement anyway. So. Thanks. Thank it's you. messy. Thanks, Paul. Now we had a question here. Uh, Marcus Ford, QT. One question that popped into my mind already this morning, but also throughout um, the day, um, is around affect. And Elizabeth, this is a question for, for you because I think your talk um, um, triggered that question for me again, which is that we all, in a way, here subscribe to an understanding of rationality and enlightenment and theory and how that would translate into action, into change, into practice. And we look at certain things and we would say, well, isn't it logic what we need to do? We don't even have to think of the next hundred years. There are some immediate steps we can take. But we live in peculiar times and they appear to be not quite as straightforward and not um, quite as easily be explainable through rational thinking. And so some commentators are pointing at affect as the, the kinds of um, passion, the, the, the emotional side, but even going deeper into affect theory. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how we need another framework to explain the world today to then project that onto the, the next hundred years. Look, I, <laughs> I'm not a futurist, I, but I, and I think it's really, well, two things. One is I think the, fu the future has always seemed impossible and impossibly complicated. I don't think there's probably been any time in history where people could conceivably imagine the next 100 years. Um, maybe what's different about us now is that we expect to be able to in some way or expect to even to apply design thinking to the planet. Um, which I think is, I mean, it's probably somewhere between a dangerous hubris and actually a necessity because we do have, collectively, we have the power to change the planet, but what we don't have is the capacity to act collectively. So that seems to me to be um, unhelpful in a way. But I also think that one of the principal mistakes that we make is in defining how as inheritors of the Corbusian, you know, instrumentalism that we've all discussed, we consistently define use as a machine-like thing, and we conceive ourselves and by extension nature as machines, which we know if we give it more than 20 seconds thought is a complete misunderstanding of ourselves and of nature and of our relationship with nature, and that if we could build into our understanding some um, wiser, deeper recognition of affect and of how our subjective selves actually relate to the world in a much different, more complicated, more imaginative way than 
we pretend is the truth, we would actually design places that were looser and more beautiful and more tolerant and more like, probably more like um, informal settlements. In fact, we would allow things to happen more than making them happen. And I think if we could, and that's really um, engaging our subject self more than ourselves as objects. And I think if we could learn to do that, I know that that's a big ask because humanity's not good at that sort of, it, that involves us really getting, going up a few chakras, you know, all of us. And, and that seems improbable. Um, so uh, it is a big ask, but I sort of think that's where we need to go is a bit sideways from just, okay, so this is how you make it happen for the future. Because after all, we've tried building flexibly. I mean, wasn't that like 1963? Wasn't that wasn't the Pompidou Center about that? You know, the, all that kind of, you just make it really loose and then everyone can do whatever they like with it. I mean, that so doesn't work, it really, because it just sort of, you know, mobile walls stick in one place. So I just think it's all really, in the end, about understanding ourselves in a way that's, that it, and that's so I think we need women in the world, you know? So that you, they could, because they're better at that. I mean, let's face it. They're just better at the nonlinear stuff. Um, and desperately, desperately need female leadership everywhere. Mm. So. Right. I'm going to ask the next question because I can't see anyone. Oh, we've got one here. All right. I'm going to jump in though because Elizabeth invited a women's question, so we'll have the microphone here. Um, but I'm actually going to ask Eva, um, Evelina because I was so struck by your comment that people know how to use a good street when they encounter one. <laughs> Could you tell us what challenges your own practice might mean for wider practice, given that we are a school that's dedicated to teaching practitioners. What, how should we be teaching future practitioners differently? S mm -hmm. Send them to our summer school, perhaps. Ah. <laughs> um, no, but I, I really think that um, going out of the, the classroom and, and touching things with your own hands, and really understanding the um, the weight of, of a line that you draw on, on your computer in, in real life, what it means to, um, to build something and how things join together and how, um, you know, how, how people react to that and, 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 and appropriate those structures or spaces. That's an, an invaluable experience. I think it makes not, you know, not only makes you a better designer, but a better human being. Thank you. Yes. So, uh we going the right way about talking about cities at all, or should we be thinking of another system completely? I'm going to throw to Hugo. <laughs> um, oh, oh dear. See, I, I'd so love to... I'm trying to think if I had, had a case study sample that does that, and it's escaping me at the moment. I think... I, I want to say, because I, I, I personally love walking through cities. I, I have great great fun and I take great pleasure out of that um, when, when I'm not working and, and so on. And, and so I think that inherently we, we will stay in our settlements. I, I'm, maybe I'm being too optimistic uh, about it um, and, and I like to think that we are able to resist change. I mean, I think, just, just thinking off the top of my head right now, for example, the building of the Thames Barrier, which I know we can go into a discussion about man changing the world to suit their own ends for, for whatever good or bad reason. But I think that we have been successful in, in retaining um, certain settlements and, and by extension the, the culture and the sense of civic pride, I hope, um, in some of these places. And, and so I think we, we will develop means of perhaps doing that. Um, and, and I'd like to say that in, in some of my examples, they are perhaps very material in, in the sense that they're there, but, but there is this chance nevertheless that we can keep our cities and, and where we live, um, but also adapt it to times ahead. Can I say something about that? You can. I was going to ask you another question, but I'll allow oh, that. Really and then we've got a question over um, there. Because I just think that's a really interesting question. And I, um, in my most optimistic moments, I think th there's, you know, a design to all this. <laughs> Not all that. Um, but, for example, you, you can see the fact that nobody can afford to live in Sydney anymore as a good thing, because I think in, you'll find that in 100 years, cities will have moved, or at least um, population will have shifted uh, to uh, 
inland, more to inland Australia, I think we'll find ways of um, understanding nature better, which is not saying a lot, um, in that regard. And, and I think, I mean, the only, as far as I know, the only place in Australia which is predicted to have higher rainfall in the future is Broome, and I have um, postulated the new cities there. But, it, I mean, even, you know, even Dubbo, Goulburn, Bathurst, Orange, blah, blah, there are towns there waiting for population, and if you look at them, they are already growing. Mudgee, I discovered this morning, has got almost no rental properties left. People are, young people are already moving out. Young creatives are moving out, and they're always the first. And places like Braidwood and Goulburn and Wagga are, are full of them. So I think, and I think that's fascinating, because they're not just taking with them need for somewhere to live. What they're taking with them is green thinking. Cowra, for example, amazing stuff happening with bioenergy in Cowra from refugee artists from Sydney. If you go and have a look around at what's happening, it's really, I think it might bring Australia alive. I think it's going to be very interesting. I'm curious as to how, in exploring all of those theories and in trying to put it into practice, how do you navigate and negotiate with existing power structures? The kind of work we do, um, tactical urbanism, I think that's, uh, it's often seen as, as activism and in, often it really is activism. But then there's something about um, the, uh, the notion of, of, of activism or the way it's, it's carried out that it's always somehow the, uh, in the opposition. Like, you know, like we're, uh, the, the government structures are somewhere on the other side of the, the glass wall and we're standing outside and just banging on it and, and, and screaming. Uh, well, we definitely prefer to be in the same room and to have a, a, a productive dialogue. Uh, and I've seen a lot of uh, great activists because of their kind of um, aggressive attitude maybe. And, and you know, they're, protesting makes them happy somehow. And, uh, you know, they don't even want to get into that room and have that conversation. But I think that's very important. That's the only way to, um, you know, to move forward and to actually improve something. And so, that w well, we always say that um, the, like, the big decisions are made somewhere on the top and then changes are quite often initiated at the bottom. But the real world uh, work really happens somewhere in the middle in very boring meeting rooms with... Uh, unattractive drawings, often without any windows, and endless discussions and, and work sessions, and you know, it's it's not a beautiful <laughs> process, but that's how it's really done. Cool. Well, I think it's a it's a really good question. I think um, part of the the issue is the fact that, say, compared to twenty or thirty years ago, there's a lot more stakeholders involved in the in the process these days. Say so 20 or 30 years ago, you would have had an architect who'd sort of take the whole thing from conception and drawings all the way through, whereas now we know there's bean counters and all the other things involved and, and those sorts of drivers. And, and I think, you know, Rod was sort of getting to that sort of with business, you know, they, they might agree the principles, but the question is we want to see those really good placemaking principles taken to reality. And then the issue then will become, well, what happens when you start doing financial and economic analysis and therefore you get into all these other things. Hence, one of the reasons for the tall towers that you see is that they're often joint ventures and the private sector will take so many units and the government gets the rest and they get the revenue. So these are, these are the hard things, I think, to try and get this sort of beauty. And, and as Elizabeth said, the thing about, you know, theory and practice, I think that's a really good point, sort of being a lot more, you know, sort of grounded in what both are. I think I, I'll start this off by being a bit more scary, which is when, when I was doing this research and I was walking around museums and, and supposed public spaces, you, you'd be surprised at the number of times that I got stopped because I look suspicious, um, you know, I'm a suspicious <laughs> character. But, but just with my camera, you know, you, you have a small camera, yay big, you're photographing the building, you take more than five, ten photos in the courtyard of, of museums or, or galleries. Um, I'm trying not to mention specific places. Um, and, and people come up to you, um, guards, security guards, they, they say, oh, you know, what are you doing? Why, why are you photographing them? And, and of course, I had my staff ID. You just make up a story. Oh, yes, I, I'm a sessional academic. Um, I'm doing research on architecture. But, but it is a reminder, I suppose, that, that in spite of 
the ideas we have that our city is a public, porous, accessible space, it, it's surprising just how territorial um, the, the individuals within these spaces are, even if the spaces themselves look seamless and you can walk straight through and straight in without, without any problem. And having said that, you know, I think it manifests itself most clearly in New York now, where, where you know, you, you, it, to go into some of these museums, I, I went through security checks. You know, I might as well have taken a flight back to Hong Kong. <laughs> Um, on, on this journey, which, which I think is a shocking reminder of how increasingly closed, potentially, our cities are becoming, which, which is actually quite scary. Do, do I have a solution to that? No, no. I, I know. I, I feel like I'm ending on a very a sad note there. But, but yeah, so, so that, that was my experience of, of it. Sad but real. Um, Elizabeth Farrelly began her journey with this school on an unsuccessful hunt for the ideas that shaped Sydney. You nearly broke my heart, Elizabeth. Now, she ended it by talking about the poverty of intellectual discourse about the city, and I hear that as a challenge to all of us who practice, who learn, who teach, and who research in the School of Architecture, Design and Planning. And hopefully in a hundred years when Hugo is sitting here, he is telling us a very, very happy story about the ideas that shaped Sydney and the public intellectuals and researchers and practitioners who made them happen. So thanks to our panel. <laughs> <laughs>